Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for um, the, <laughs> the very um, detailed uh, introduction. Uh, you can Google me, I'm Googleable. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, um, uh, and f before I start talking about the topic, I would like to um, thank the um, Honorable Vice Chancellor and the Principal and the rest of the management of TUT for this opportunity. I'm humbled and um, I am really glad that I'm here and I'm happy and I am expecting inshallah that you people will enjoy this session where I'm going to share with you some really amazing, amazing things uh, in the field of marketing. But before again I start that, referring to what the principal, the honorable principal highlighted, the four P's of marketing are still valid. And uh, those f four P's of marketing, we cannot get rid of them, you know. As, as long as you're a marketing person, you will, you will have these four P's of marketing. But yes, uh, things have changed over the passage of time and that's why I'm here to, to tell you what marketing was many years ago and uh, what marketing is going to be in the future. Taking you out of the dizziness, uh, <laughs> it will make you more dizzy uh, to, to see the topics that are coming ahead in the field of marketing, but I'm not going to talk about it now. Uh, how I planned this presentation is, I started from a very basic, uh, where those of you who actually don't know a lot about marketing, so I have some basics, few slides, then I will take you uh, to a more advanced level and then to the highlight of the presentation, which is the future of marketing, and I'm sure that all of you are more interested in that. So I'll try to move faster on the basic things, not very fast, faster on the basic things, and then we will spend more time um, on the future. Give me a minute and let me stop my slides. Now the thing is that I'm a, ki I'm a different, I should not say I'm a different kind of teacher, but I'm a kind of presenter who is difficult to stay on the dice. I walk a lot, I move a lot in the, in the conferences or in the presentation, in my classes, but um, I was informed by the, the, uh, the personnel who are responsible for recording and audio that no, don't move this, don't move. You, you don't have to move. And then like I feel very congested, but I hope I'll do justice. Um, I'll try to stick my, myself to this dice, but at any time when I feel suffocated, I will request for a microphone, um, another microphone to walk around and keep the audience awake. Because I personally think that when you stick to one place, uh, it has a higher tendency of the audience uh, falling asleep. I also train and teach uh, presentation skills where I train people on how to present effectively. And one of the key points in effective presentation is don't stay at one place if you want the audience to stay awake. But of course, there are instances where you don't have any other option. But I'll try to do justice here and try to uh, make sure to keep you awake for as long as we can. We have water for you whenever you feel thirsty or we have restroom outside this year university you know but i also had a visit <laughs> so the the point the point i'm the point i want to make here is that uh, don't force yourself by sitting and hurting yourself if you feel like going to the restroom just go to the restroom and come back if you feel like thirsty grab a, uh, a bottle of water it's cold where is my bottle of water oh it's, it's okay so Oh, that's not special water, okay. but um, just like uh, the, the Honorable uh, Deputy Rector mentioned that I am also the leader of sustainable development goals uh, in our faculty. And one of the key points in sustainable development goals which I presented yesterday is to reduce waste. And how can we reduce waste is uh, to reuse the products that we have. So this bottle of water, when I finish, I'll refill it from a filter rather than throwing it in the dustbin and then damaging our mother earth. And I presented that yesterday. And let me have a sip of water. <laughs> so the key point is to make you feel relaxed in this presentation. Um, even though it is a very formal and I'm humbled and honored to be a part of it, um, but the motive should be learning and that is what my motive has always been if you're sitting in my classes or my lectures and for one hour you just sit because you are asked to sit and you don't take away anything um, my motive is not served 
My motive is that after leaving this session, even though it is highly uh, formal and um, very respectable and prestigious, my motive still stands the same, that I want you to learn something by the end of this seminar or this session. So I'll start with um, the highlights of the presentation, which is, I'll, as I mentioned, that I'll start with the definition of marketing. You have many definitions of marketing then the the stages in the development of marketing like the evolution of marketing what marketing was what somehow marketing is and what happened to the marketing over the period of time i'll explain that from different school of thoughts from different sources and hopefully you will enjoy that then of course as i mentioned the main um the main hero of the whole session is the future trends in the field of marketing we'll have hopefully time for discussion i would like to hear from you as well what do you know because i can see the future generation is sitting in front of me um, the new generation is sitting in front of me and i believe that they will um, shed more light on the topics that i have i will highlight hopefully soon Again, before I go to the topic, all of a sudden it came in my mind when the vice, uh, uh, the, the vice chancellor highlighted the four P's of marketing. When I go to my marketing class in the first lecture, I normally tell my students, I, I show them a uh, definition which I'm going to show you in one second. And I tell them this is what we are going to discuss for the rest of the semester. Our semester is normally three months in MBA and four months in undergrad. So three months we study the same definition and they in the first class they get astonished. They say like, how are we going to study the same definition for the whole three months? And I'm going to tell you how. The, the definition of marketing that I have studied when the Honorable Vice Chancellor studied um, is the same definition, uh, exactly the same definition I studied. I did my MBA in 2001. So that's like more than 20 years ago. And the same definition, I still teach the same definition. What is it? Marketing is the total system of business activities designed to plan, price, promote, and distribute want satisfying product and services to the target market in order to achieve organizational objectives. Now, I've been teaching this course for like more than 15 years. I've studied it for a number of years. So I have memorized this definition and there is a beauty in this definition as well. Each, almost each and every term in this definition is significant in the field of marketing. If you look at the slide, you will find some terms like business activities. Now, what is a, I'll just quickly highlight. What do you mean by business activities? We are running an organization. We are running a business. Marketing is all about generating business for you. What is business? Profit for you. Now, some of you may be thinking, what about the non-profit organization? The non-profit organization also earn a lot of money. Do you know that, right? Mm -hmm. The non-profit organization earns a lot of money. Yeah, their objective is not money. Organizational objective is not money. But marketing highlights it that if you are a marketer, your focus should be always on business. How to do that? By focusing on the four P's of marketing. Product planning, pricing, promotion, and distribution. What are these four P's of marketing? I would say these are the, the core philosophies of marketing. If you want to have a successful business, you need to design your product and product itself covers around two to three chapters in the book of marketing. Then you need to design proper pricing. Pricing itself covers one to two chapters in the book of marketing. Then you design proper promotion. And we'll talk about promotion in the coming slides as well. Promotion is again the main, um, uh, the, the main focus of the, my, my today's presentation. And then distribution. So the four P's of marketing is what marketing is all about. Now. I did my PhD on a topic and I have researched that extensively as well over the, the last couple of years. It's on customer satisfaction. Research shows that if you manage to satisfy your customer, that customer has a high chance of coming back to your company. Now pay attention. If a customer come back to your company, again, research validate that you earn more from a repeat customer than a new customer. Are you with me? Every time if your company go and search for a new customer, you spend a lot of resources. But if you somehow manage to attract the same customer again and again, you save a lot of resources. What resources are we talking about? If this company comes to me and I don't know this company, this company will start marketing their self to me first. Okay, I'm ABC company, I produce water, I'm good water, blah, blah, blah. They are spending resources on introducing their self to me. But if I already know them, they have to skip that part. So that resource is spent on reducing the price of the product. So I'm not going to bore you on 
going into deep philosophies of marketing there, but satisfaction of customer is of prime importance. It is in all fields, irrespective of it is a business or it's an NGO or it's whatever. Even if it is a university, your students are your customers. You have to satisfy them. How to satisfy them? Ask them what do they want. They want, for example, good teachers. They want, for example, scholarships. They want this. Of course, you cannot blindly follow whatever the students say. Sorry, those of you who are students. Uh, the, the thing is that you cannot blindly follow them. But if you, your focus should be on how to make sure that they are happy because they are the one who are going to use their positive or negative word of mouth for you. They are the one who are later on going to tell their kids, oh, go to TUT. I studied there. It's an amazing university. But if they're not happy, they're going to make sure that their kids at least don't go to that university or that's that college or that office or that shop. So make sure satisfaction of the market is there. This is the first definition I show in the marketing classes. But then it's not a very contemporary definition. The most contemporary definition which I selected is published in 2021 is marketing is to engage customers and build profitable relationships. Marketing is all about engaging customers. What do you mean by engaging customers? I hope that you remember a few minutes ago I told you the focus should be on how to make sure that the customer come back to your company. That is engaging customers. Once the customer buy your product, that's not the end of the story. That's why when we go and use Uber, I used Uber yesterday, day before yesterday, and the moment uh, my, my ride was finished, Uber sent me a push notification. How do you rate this ride? Would you, do you think that you will ride with us again? Tell us something about the, the driver, the clear, and all those facts. All the companies do that. Why do they do that? Because they want to engage with you. And there is a philosophy behind it. When you being a company stay engaged with the customers, you know what happens? The customer remember you. So you are somehow using customers as your free marketing managers. If the company, if the customers remember you, they sit in their gathering and they talk about you. And a lot of companies now focus a lot on how to engage customer one way or another way. Every now and then companies like Pizza Hut or McDonald's or KFC send us an email. We don't want them. We are not in the mood for KFC. Why do they do this push notification to us? Because they want to engage with us. And as soon as a customer is engaged with a company, it results in profitability. Now this term is also very important to highlight. Profitable relationship. Not all customers that a company has are profitable customers. Some customers are very good and some customers are not so good. So you have to find out which customers are good and which customers are not good. There are methods, there are formulas through which you can find out the customers which are really profitable for your organization so that you spend more money on them so that they stay with you because they're profitable for you. Those customers who are not profitable, what do you do? You try to stay away from them and don't spend a lot of money on them. Of course, there are many other topics linked to that, but that is not the scope of my today's presentation. Talking about what marketing was, what marketing is, and what happened to the marketing over the couple of years or the previous many, many decades. We call it the evolution of marketing. Those of your marketing experts or marketing students, you have, I'm sure that you have heard of something which is called marketing management orientation. What is marketing management orientation? These are the different philosophies of marketing. These are the different stages of marketing over the time span, a certain time span. Now, this is the topic that I normally explain from two school of thoughts. One explains this topic, I'm going to explain that in a while. One explains this topic as the timeline of marketing. What marketing was a century ago, for example. And another school of thought explains it as existing marketing philosophy. So I'm going to explain it from both. Let's explain it from a time perspective. These are the common stages you will find in all the books, by the way, the product, production, sales, and marketing. The other two are very new, especially the last one is so new that you will not find it even in the books. So the first three or four are very common, product and production, the sales orientation, and the marketing orientation or the marketing concept. From the timeline school of thought, pay attention. The production orientation stage is a stage where the scholars agree that it started before World War I, so the early 1900th century. It was the time where the focus of the producers were how to produce large quantity of product. Pay attention. Now, 
even though the producer focus on producing large quantity of product, but you have very stiff competition, right? So many people are producing the same products. Beg, am I, am I audible, right? Yes. yes. I can slow down and speed up if you want, by the way. <laughs> I can talk slow, like slow, no, slow, I mean slow in the pace, not in volume. I have a thing there. So uh, I don't want you to like get used to with the same pace because when you get used to with the same pace, by the way, uh, we'll be talking about neuromarketing. Neuromarketing is related to brain, right? Uh, I read psychology as a leisure reading. I love psychology, so I read about it. Human brain have a cap capability to mute things. Do you know that, right? <laughs> I'll give an example. When you wear a perfume in the morning, how many like perfume? Raise your hands. All of us like perfume. I love perfume. So when you wear a good perfume, say Giorgio Armani or Paco Rabanne or whatever perfume you're using, you wear it, it smells really good in the morning, right? But after five minutes, you don't smell it anymore. But the people around you smell it really hard. Then he said, but I don't smell it. Why? Because your brain have already muted that smell. When you, when you travel in the train, the first five or 10 minutes you hear that noise, right? But after 10, 20 minutes, your brain automatically muted. So our brain have the capability of muting certain things. So that is a tip to all of your presenters or teachers or um, experts in the stage. Make sure to variate your, your tone, your volume, your pace. Because that way, the, you are not letting the audience mute you. They are looking at you. And, and we, have some, we have something, human, human psychology is so crazy. We have something which is called autopilot. That is, a, that, is a, that is a terminology taken from aviation industry. You know aviation industry. When an aeroplane is in the, uh, in the air, you see the captain walking around you. Who is, who is flying the aeroplane? Autopilot, the computer. So we people are on autopilot, I tell my students as well. well my students, when they're in autopilot, they would nod their head automatically. So <laughs> the, 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 brain, the brain have automatically muted you. Like they don't know what you're talking about. They were like, <laughs> yeah? So I don't want you, I don't want you to do that. Uh, getting back to the topic. So production orientation stage or product orientation stage was a stage before World War I and the focus was on how to produce large quantity of product. Why? Because only few producers and a lot of customers. So the producers were not worried about if my customer would be satisfied or not satisfied. I'm sure that you've heard of a, a, a sentence, a very nice sentence. It is called customer is the boss, customer is the king, yeah. customer is always right. Back then, producer was the boss. Producer was the king. Producer was right. So whatever producer produced, the customer had to buy. Why? Because uh, back then, the customer didn't have any, uh, any other options. And we still have that, by the way. I'm sure that those who are economic students, they know it is called monopoly. In, monop in monopoly, you have only one producer produ producing the products and the customers have to buy irrespective of the prices, the design, the quality and so on. So that was the time. Then fast forward, World War II. Scholar says it is after World War II, the next stage emerged and that stage is sales orientation stage. What is sales orientation stage? The name itself highlights it clearly. The focus of the companies were how to use selling techniques to sell the product. Why? Because after World War II, there were a lot of products and people were not that much willing to spend on buying products. In fact, a lot of people didn't even have money to buy a product. So what, what the producer did? The producers tried to introduce new methods to induce the product sales, to motivate people to buy the product, sales orientation. Down the line, 1980s, after 1980s, a new stage was introduced by scholars of marketing, and that stage is called the marketing concept or the marketing orientation stage, which is the fourth stage. And some scholars say that is the stage which is still going on until today. Why? Because the focus of marketing orientation stage is still customer satisfaction. So if you produce a product, not because you like a black color, because the customer like black color. You put a price on the product, not because your, 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 your profit should be higher, because the customers can pay, are willing to pay only that price for that product. So you're following market orientation stage. The two last stages, which are very interesting, and in the market orientation stage, the concept of customer is the boss, customer is the king, uh, was introduced. Societal marketing is um, a fairly new stage, um, started 2000. Some people say that actually it's a part of marketing orientation stage. Some scholars say, no, these are different stages. I will explain it from both perspectives. So the societal marketing is a stage which focuses and which tells companies that do not focus only on customer satisfaction, 
What was where was customer satisfaction? Marketing orientation, right? Yeah. This one. It's an it's a proper sequence, by the way. So the 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 societal marketing says do not only focus on customer satisfaction, focus on society satisfaction. So customer is a part of the society. So if you are a person who are the first customer, there are people who are related to you. Those people should also be taken care of. I'll give an example. I'm sorry to those who smoke. Yeah, I, I don't smoke. So those people, those companies who produce tobacco or cigarettes, they are only until the marketing stage. They can never go to the fifth and the sixth stage. You know why? Because smoking only satisfies customers. It never satisfies the people who are around you, especially those who are non-smoker around you. So I, I, almost all my friends are smoking, and whenever I, I am with them and they smoke, it, it hurts me. I, I'm a teacher. You, that's the only source of income for me. I mean the throat. <laughs> so if, if, if it is messed up, yeah, because, of the, because someone else is smoking near me and I'm also inhaling smoke and that is even dirtier than what he's inhaling. You know why, right? Because that is called, that is called passive smoking. Have you heard of passive smoking? Yeah. Medical research have proven that passive smoking is more harm harmful than active smoking. It does not mean that start, go start active smoking. It means that stay away from all type of smokes. <laughs> yeah? So the passive smoking is a smoke which comes out of the mouth of another person smoking. So the person is already doing something bad and now his old dirt is also added with it and he's, he's throwing on your face. So that is more harmful. Now, that is what I mean by societal marketing and tobacco companies. I'm, just, I'm not against tobacco companies, sorry those who have tobacco companies, right? But, but the, some, these kind of companies who satisfy customers but don't care about the society can never reach societal marketing. Societal marketing introduces the concept of stakeholders. Please note it down, stakeholders. Stakeholders are all those people who are related to the company directly or indirectly. It includes customers, it includes shareholders, it includes the friends of customers, it includes the parents of customers, it includes the society, the people, people. It includes people. So if you are producing a product, any product, which satisfies not only the customer but the people, your societal marketing. Look at the presenter in my hand, how beautiful is this thing. I've been teaching for more than 15 years. Before I was introduced to this thing, I told you I never stand here. That is because I was told to stand here. I walk around a lot. So every time, sorry, bear me for a while. So I walk around a lot. Every time I had to change slide without this thing, I had to go all the way to the computer and change the slide. But then I was introduced to this beautiful product where I can change the slide anywhere, where I can point to things. Previously, I had to go and touch it. In this case, it is impossible to go and touch it, right? So this is a product which is giving me high level of satisfaction. But not only me, it is making you people happy as well, right? Because you, I can point it there. How odd will it look if I stand on the table and touch this quality of life? Yeah, it will look bad, right? So this is, what, this is what is the example of a good quality. This is, this is an example of a good societal marketing product. So if you are a business or if you want to start a business, don't only think about yourself. If you think about yourself, your product and production stage. Don't think about the customer only. That is marketing. Don't think about the customer only. Think about the people. If your product is beneficial for the customers and the people, you are societal marketing. Now hold your breath, this is another one. W what else? Something more is expected of companies and that is called quality of life marketing. What is quality of life marketing? If you are a company, you take care of this customer satisfaction, you take care of the societal satisfaction, people, and you also take care of the non-living things. You take care of everything around you, the, the environment at large. You take care of the plants, you take care of the water in the water stream. You take care of, for example, the chairs around you. All these things, if you take care of in your production or your business, you're following quality of life marketing. So that's why, even yesterday I gave an example, that's why companies are moving from plastic bottles to recyclable bottles plastic cups to paper cups and go to, for example, some of these multinational companies, go to Starbucks, for example, you'll find out that they will give you in the, in the paper cup, now no more plastic cup. That's why companies like retail companies are not providing you plastic bags anymore. 
I'm sure that's here as well. In, in many countries, they've already stopped it. So they give you in the recyclable paper bag. Why? Because they want to focus on quality of life marketing. A lot of the people ask me a question, and you may be thinking about the same question as well. That do you think that these companies care about us and the environment? And that is a debatable topic. I don't know, maybe and maybe not, but they don't have any other option. If, if, that's why I give an example of Starbucks. If I go and ask Starbucks, is it, is it profitable for you to change your whole system from plastic cups to paper cups? Probably the answer would be no. They may have incurred a lot of losses, but why did they do that? Because people talk about them. And when people talk about them, you go and buy from them. So it's more of a marketing thing. But let's not get pessimistic here. Optimistically speaking, companies are putting efforts to make sure that their products are beneficial not only for the customers and the society, but for everything around. Take example of trains and buses and all these other companies. These are all quality of life marketing and societal marketing example. The new philosophy that is related to it, which I presented yesterday, is called circular economy. And those of you who were in my presentation yesterday, sorry to them, uh, I have to quickly repeat it, not the whole thing, but just a glimpse of it. What is circular, circular economy? That makes sure you produce a product that can be reused, that can be refurbished, that can be reprocessed, that can be repurposed, and that can be recycled in a green manner. Why? Because if you produce a product that eventually harms the environment and the society, you cannot reach this five and six stage. And five and six stage is the stage which can save us and the generations to come. And I gave an example yesterday as well, and someone even asked me in the audience that how, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Pakistan, by the way, and last two weeks, uh, we had seen really bad floods in Pakistan. And uh, even United Nations and the experts in the Met Office, they, uh, they, they agreed that it is because of the global warming. It has never been the situation in Pakistan. It, uh, it, has, it has displaced more than a million people, more than a thousand people died because of those floods. The floods in those places which were never expected. Why? Because companies are only worried about customer satisfaction. They don't care about the, the society. They don't care about the, uh, the environment at large. I'm not talking about all companies, but because we are also part of it, by the way. When I drink this water and I throw the bottle, I have damaged the environment one way or another way. So find out how to make sure to reuse the products that you have. And an advice that I can give you is, make sure to buy those products which are long lasting. Don't change the products very often. Even if it is your dress, even if it is the product, this, this, this presenter is with me for more than 10 years now. I have, I can buy a no, now a very better and big state of the art presenter where, where you can have a touch pointer and so on and so forth. I don't need it. It's okay. It's doing my job. The point I want to make here is try your best. That's a piece of advice. Try your best to contribute to the environment in your own capacity. Don't, don't, when you eat something or drink, drink something, don't open the window and throw it on the road. Yeah, you did that for your personal satisfaction, but it has eventually harmed the environment and your generations to come. So make sure that your generation to come don't suffer. We may die in the coming hundred years. All of us sitting here may not be here in the coming hundred years, but hopefully our generations would be here. And then if we don't care about these things now, that will create a big problem. So that was about the timeline perspective. Let's quickly discuss the other school of thought. Who says that these stages are still there? The companies still follow them. They say that production orientation is a stage where the focus is on ready availability. If you follow production orientation stage, you will make sure that the product is readily available for the customers. If the customer come to your shop and he asks for something and you say, sorry, out of stock, you are not following production orientation stage. Production orientation stage, ready availability. <clears throat> product orientation stage, focus on quality of the product. If you focus on quality of the product, you produce a quality product, you are following product orientation stage. Sales and marketing are the same focusing on selling techniques, market on focusing on customer satisfaction, societal marketing focusing on society, and quality of life marketing is the same as focus on the environment at large. Now, the key point of the, of the presentation. What is the future? What do you think? What do you see in the future of marketing? I want, I want you people to tell me something that you know. Uh, the, 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 wise, the, the, wise, the deputy dean have already given you a teaser. 
but I'm sure that you don't remember that. You remember that? Yeah, you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is the future? Come in, young generation is sitting in front of me. I can see young, young people, young, uh, it's not like the rest of you are old, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still young, all of, all of us are young. Yes? Look, I think at the end of the day, we're going to move more forward towards engagement with people. I think okay. after um, COVID, after, even though technology is taking over our lives, we're moving to online shopping. Mm. There's going to be a need for some face-to-face -face interaction at some point, again, mm. in the future. That's Again, so you mean that it, we are going back to the, we will go back to. But the price will go up. That's when history repeats. Yeah, us. yeah. Wow, that, that's, a, that's a good one. I'm not so, sure. yeah, w w we are not sure about the future. These are all predictions anyway. But, but I, I remember what I, I remember what I have, what I saw when I was a kid in the science fiction movie. These things are happening right now. <laughs> when I was a kid, I watched a movie by the name of uh, some of you who are same age as me. Don't ask me my age. Um, then it was a movie by the name of Knight Rider. Mm -hmm. How many of you remember? Knight Rider was a, a movie where, where a car would automatically come to the driver. Yeah. And I would always fantasize as a kid that, oh my God, there would, be a, there would be a watch that I would talk to. I can literally talk to my watch now, right? It's on my rest. 20 years ago, I was fantasizing it. We can literally have a car, it can drive to you. And we know about aut uh, autonomous driving and so on. Yes, you have a question? Um, no, I oh, sorry, you have to add, yeah. yeah. I will say um, also moving a lot towards experiential marketing where you pay for experiences mm. because everything is digitalized. Yeah. So everybody wants instant gratification. Yeah, yeah. So then at the end of the day, we're going to pay for the experiences because a lot of the things will be offered digitally. Absolutely. Um, well, well, it's a part of services marketing. I, I, I agree with you. That's, uh, the, the world is moving towards more on charging you for every experience that you will have. And the experiences are also getting top notch now. The experience, for example, I'll give an example, is that, for example, in Taiwan, they have, um, the, the, the researchers have already um, come up with a jacket, a jacket that can hug you. So like if someone send you a hug on your WhatsApp and you're wearing that jacket and connected via Bluetooth with your phone, the jacket can also give you a hug. Mm -hmm. And how far can it go? I don't know. So, so yeah, they, they, these are amazing things coming up. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you about more things. Anyone else know what should be the future? Yes. Uh, we're going to move more towards the Internet of Things, more digital. Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> Internet of Things is a good one. Okay, <laughs> what else? What do you think? Come on, give me some feedback. What do you yes? I just think that um, the whole idea of big data and how we mine it and how we're going to apply that to offer somebody oh, yeah. something before they actually know that they Nice. That actually, you, 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 you're now, now I'm, that's a very nice point that you have highlighted and that's why I'm not going to ask you any more questions because you are just explaining things that I have on the slide. So that's very good. No, 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 that's a very good, that's a very good point. Big data and s telling the people what they want. That's very interesting, by the way. Telling the people what they want. Oh, do you know the difference between need and want, right? Uh, a need is a need is a necessity, right? You cannot survive without it. Want is a, a wish. It's a, it's not a necessity. Without want, you can survive. Now the the companies are trying their best through different methods. I'm going to show you in a while through different methods to make sure that they make your want your need. They they are converting your wants to become your need. For example, 10 to 15 years ago, this was not our need, right? The phone was not our need. It was a wired phone, you know, wired phone, right? Landline phone. I would go to my campus, my university, when I was a student back in 2001 and 2003. I would go to my, 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 my university without, because back then we didn't have any smartphones. So I'll go to my university and my family would be okay and I'd be okay. I will come in the evening, every, everything okay. But now if I leave my home and this is off for only a few hours, in less than an hour, everybody gets panicked. What is going on? Why my family is not receiving the call? You start calling your friends. Can you call? Can you check on my f my, my my home? What is going on? Nobody is receiving. So yes, the things are becoming towards more need based. The the companies are trying their best to make sure that what you wished for, you try to get it, and without it, you don't survive. And that's why the terms like online oxygen. Have you heard of that? Online oxygen. <sighs> 
the companies, the technology companies have, should I use the word trap? The technology companies have trapped us so much that if we are not connected, we feel suffocated. If there are no signals, we feel suffocated. Now, I, wa I came from Malaysia to, to, uh, to, to South Africa. My flight time was 16 hours. And I was like, okay, for 16 hours, it's boring. What am I going to do? Of course, they provided all this multimedia and movies and so on and so forth. But then I was so amazed to see that there was internet there. So the 16 hour passed like that because now my oxygen is there. Even though I'm an old guy, that, that is more oxygen for the youth now. The youth cannot survive without their TikTok and their Instagram and their this and that and then all these. Okay, we'll talk about it in a while. So we'll discuss Internet of Things. What is Internet of Things? That is the focus. We'll discuss about artificial intelligence in marketing, which is called AI marketing. That's crazy. If I tell you things, we'll see things that will, that will astonish you that, oh my God, is it good or bad? We'll discuss that in, as well later on in the Q&A session. Then we have augmented reality in marketing or AR marketing. And marketing is now moving towards something really, really astonishing, which is called the Internet of Brains, which the wise dean have already highlighted in, 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 in the beginning. So Internet of Brains, that is a research conducted which I'm going to show you. We'll discuss about all of these one by one. I hope we'll have time. Please give me a buzz when I exceed the time, okay? Because I love talking and I will not stop. Um, then we have then we have battery out. No, I'm just kidding. Then we have something which is called interactive dreaming. Inter how many of you dream? Everybody dream. And how would you find your dream to be designed for you before you sleep? Oh my, I want to dream about this person. Oh, no, not person, forget about that. I want to dream about this place. I want to go to the Disneyland in my dream. Now you cannot go to the Disneyland when you think of going to the Disneyland in your dream because dreams are not in control of you. You, you cannot control your dreams, right? You sleep and whatever is there in the subconscious comes, comes in your dream. But then the time is not far, I'm going to show you, where before you actually sleep you can, okay, I want to go today to um, Eiffel Tower in my dream. So actually you sleep and there you, there you are in Eiffel Tower, enjoy your time and when you wake up you're, you're back. And by the way, dream is <clears throat> dreaming, especially lucid dreaming, uh, is more lifelike. I'm sure that you have experienced it, right? Have you experienced lifelike dreaming? Lifelike dreaming. When you wake up, you feel like, yeah, that happened actually. But that was a dream. It happened actually. We'll talk about how marketers are using it. So, and the last one we'll discuss is neuromarketing. What the marketers are doing with our brain. And that is related to what um, uh, one of the participants uh, highlighted. And uh, you, you would be astonished to see. It is, when I was reading, and I do read these things every now and then, it sometimes scares me, but then we don't have any other option, you know? We, we just go with the flow. We, we have to go with the flow with that. So they're introducing all these things, and some of us know, and some of us don't even know that these are there. And how they are influencing our subconscious to take decisions, that is crazy, I'll show you. So let's start with the easy one. That is an old one, now very old. I think more than 10 years old now. It is called Internet of Things. What is Internet of Things? In simple words, when your internet is connected with the things that you have. For example, it is very common now to have internet in your phone. It is very common to have internet connected with your TV. It is very common now to have your internet connected with your fridge. It is now very easily available to, from your office. You just completed your task in the office in the evening, say five, you're going back to your home and you want to have a cup of coffee while you're on the road with the click of one button in your, in your smartphone, you can uh, you can process a coffee maker in your home. The moment you reach there, the coffee will be ready for you as soon as you step in. Or for example, you are going home and you from your phone using internet, put a certain timer on the microwave oven to process or heat up the food for you. So all these things are there now. Oh, I, I, I have it, I can actually show you. I have an um, air purifier in my home and it is totally internet connected. In fact, it is so much intelligent, which will come in the intelligent marketing as well, that it can actually show me um, 
in my home i'm sitting here in south africa it shows me for example the air quality it shows me for example uh, how much is the ultraviolet rays how much is this and that so all these things are for example the smart cameras that we have in our home no matter wherever you are you need just your smart device to show you whatever is going on in the place where you have installed smart cameras my friend uh, who is in the United States of America, he started one, um, one business, one outlet. Uh, he's, uh, he's in the food and beverages. And then uh, recently he started five. And I said, you're one person. How do you look after all these? He said, I don't even look after one. I said, then how do you do that? He said, I have my smart device and I, s I have cameras and I can actually see everything going on. Everything is recorded. So every I have assigned tasks to people and they do things and I just record it. So what is it? Internet of Things. Your car is connected with the internet. Now, I'm sure that you've heard of electric cars and one of the pioneers, in fact, the pioneers of electric cars, we have Tesla. Have you heard of Tesla? Now, Tesla example, I would also like to give you the artificial intelligence, but Tesla car is fully internet enabled. So you have everything that you want to see or you want to tell the service center is through the internet, the data is transferred to them. My, in, in Malaysia, my friend bought uh, a car. It's a local brand, but it's a very good car he bought. And they give him a five years free internet SIM in the car. So like I was, what is it for? Because it is internet enabled car. It's just like we have, m those of you have um, Apple phone, you say that, hey Siri, so the Siri comes, right? Or those of you have Android, you say, hey Google, so the Google come, for example. Now in the car, you say the name of the car, it's Proton, by the way, you say, hey Proton, and the car will, the car assistant will say, how can I help you? Can you open the windows? And the windows will come down. And that is internet enabled. It's like, oh my God, this is next level internet of things. So the Internet of Things is old. It has been there for more than 10 years now. We are moving toward even more crazier things. And that is artificial intelligence in marketing. We know intelligence, right? Human intelligence. Artificial intelligence in simple word is machine intelligence. And we know that machines are getting more intelligent day by day, right? How? Now, I don't need to remember what time and what day I have a presentation in TUT. A machine will remind me, right? Because machine is more intelligent than me. Artificial intelligence is playing a vital role nowadays in the years to come. Will play a vital role in the year to come. Examples I will give you. What do you see on the slide right now? What do you see? You see a machine, a robot, solving, ap apparently solving a problem. And that, is the, that was the task, that has been the task of human to solve problems. But now we have machines solving the problems. Now solving these kind of problems which you see requires intelligence. It doesn't require programming only. You know there's, there's a difference between intelligence and programming, right? Programming is a set thing, a set code, and the, the machine acts only in those lines. Intelligence is you give the liberty to machine to go beyond those lines. So the machine try to learn from you. Please go and uh, watch a video. Um, I could not include a lot of things because of time, time constraints, but go and watch the video, for example, Sophia. Have you heard of Sophia? Sophie? <laughs> the human, human, humanoid or the humanobot? Now, the fr I, I remember, I, I normally follow um, these kind of tech news. So when Sophia was introduced, uh, she was asked a question. Suf Sufia is an artificial, artificial human, right? Just like that. And she was, sh should I say she or he? So like the, that thing was asked that, um, yeah, that thing, uh, it's, it's uh, ap apparently a female looking and her name is Sophia, so that's why I'm calling it her, but we don't know if it is her or him. But, but that thing was asked that, do you think that the machines will take over human race? And she replied, um, Absolutely, why do we need human for? And then it created a lot of hype in the news. That is many years ago. Please go, go and Google it, you'll find it. Then it created a lot of hype in the news that, oh my God, now these companies are producing machines which eventually will take humankind. And I'm sure that you're aware that a lot of machines are taking human jobs, right? A lot of jobs. So people were already skeptical about them. And when Sufia said that, everybody was like, oh my God, get rid of these uh, artificial intelligent robots. Let's not have artificial intelligent robots. But then she had another interview, I think one or two days after that encounter. And it was, uh, it was with a famous, uh, famous celebrity. Uh, what was his name? Jimmy. Jimmy. 
Jimmy. Jimmy is a famous celebrity. I think he hosts one of the shows. And I think he asked, if I'm not wrong, you can go, you can check it on YouTube. And then he asked a question, and that in astonished me. He asked a question that Sophia, uh, a few days ago, you had an interview, and you mentioned that we don't human race. We don't human race. Uh, c computers or machines will take over because what do we need human race for? And you know what was her reply? Her reply was, ha ha ha, I thought that humans are funny. That was a joke. Just imagine how nicely she handled the situation. <laughs> so all that because, because she was artificially intelligent. She, she observed the situation in the market or in the, on the surface and she quickly, swiftly changed her statement in such a way which are human friendly, which are customers friendly, which are people friendly and now she is the first human, the first robot with the passport. Do you know that? She's the first recognized citizen with a passport. She is, she, I should not say that. She is the citizen of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a country, right? Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I think, give them a nationality, give, give her, her slash, slash him a nationality. And that now, because she's so intelligent, she can do all the crazy things um, that human cannot do. And she can crack jokes. Your, your Google can crack really good jokes. Your city can, can, can tell you good jokes, you know? And, and what is that? And if you don't like the jokes, if you don't like the jokes, they can change the jokes. Why? Based on your likeness and dislikeness. Based on your preferences. And that is what artificial intelligence is. There are more things about artificial intelligence. What do you see in the slide now? The same thing, but in a more uh, robust or um, hardcore method, and that is reading books. It is unfortunate to see that humans are no more interested in books. And robots are getting interested in books. If you want to learn, you need to read. If you want to learn from the experiences of people, the fastest way is to read. But now we don't read. Who reads? The robot read. Now we have Google, and we ask Google, hey Google, can you tell me this and that? And the Google quickly read for us from the books that we are supposed to read, and they tell us. Now it's a, it's, there are positive and negative sides of it, but the robots are reading. The two things, the two things that I want you to remember when you remember artificial intelligence, which is highlighted slightly by the audience, is machine learning and big data. These are the two things that I want you to remember. What is machine learning? Machine learning is when a machine learns the behavior of people. Here we are talking about marketing, when the machine learns the behavior of customers. And they, the machine market to you what you like or what you possibly would like. So I'll give an example. Right now, if you took a, take out your phone and all of you go to an online store, say Amazon, all of you probably will see different listings on the front page. Why? Because machine have learned your likeness and dislikeness over the period of time that you are connected with and the machine is now showing you things that has a higher chance for you to buy. I may not buy, but then it's a human psychology that the things which are a lot in front of us, we tend to buy them. It's a, it's a consumer behavior thing, by the way. That's why a lot of my students ask me this question that can be in your mind as well. That McDonald's, KFC, Pepsi, Coke, they have been there for 100 years and everybody know them. Even the kids speak the first thing is McDonald's. My kid, he would not speak anything, but when he grew up, he said McDonald's. So like even he knows McDonald's, right? But then why do they market every day? Every single day they market. And they spend millions of dollars. According to one research, they spend around $100 million every year on advertisement campaigns. Why? Because we people tend to forget things. Humans tend to forget things. Now, what do the machine do is, the machine bombard with us with the things that we may not buy, but we, when we see it 10 times, we tend to start liking it. Have you experienced that? I have experienced that. I'll tell you another example, a very good example. Have you experienced in your car or in your home listening to a song that you hate? It happens a lot, right? Sometimes a song comes in front of us and we hate it. And we say, I'm not going to listen to this song again. But then somehow you listen to it the second time and the third time. And the moment you listen to it five times, you start loving the song. Why? The same happens in 
the human brain. We, we order our brain that like it, like it, like it, and we start liking it. When we see photos of the products in front of us again and again and again and again on our devices, even though we don't need it, our brain tells us, I think you need this product. And then from, I think it moved to buy this product, and then we buy it. I was going to, I uh, normally go to one of the shopping malls in Malaysia to buy my grocery, and in that shopping mall, in the entrance of that shopping mall, there is a huge board, a huge sign board. You know what, the, what does that sign board say? My son even tell me every time. It says that if you cannot stop thinking about it, just buy it. <laughs> but that's horrible. No, no, that's not good. That's financially bad. I cannot stop thinking about so many things, but if I start buying all those things, I'll be broke by the end of the day. You understand? So that's not financially good. I also read a lot about financial freedom, and I, I, I do my own research, personal research on that. If you want to be financially free, stop, control your temptations. Yeah, especially the buying temptations. If you, if you cannot stop thinking about it, buy it. No, why would I buy it if I don't need it? I will not buy it. I will only buy it if I need it. You understand what I'm saying, right? So the artificial intelligence is now finding a way to market us the things that we have a higher chance of buying. But how? Because of machine learning, because a huge repository of data is collected on us every second. Every second, these devices co um, collect data on us. Those of you have Apple or Google or whatever phone you have, you actually give permissions to access the microphone and the camera. Have you tried that? If you're installing an app, any app, it will ask you for, please give me permission to access your microphone. No, why would you need my microphone? It's, it, it, the app is not aligned with the recording thing. But if you don't give permission, it will not install. Yeah. So forget about the apps. You're talking about Google, which is already installed in our phone. We are talking about iOS, which is installed in our Apple phones. We give them permission when we install it. So they record us. They track us. There are two, again, some people say it's good, some people say it's bad. I personally say it's good, as long as you're not doing something bad. <laughs> you should be only scared when, you, when you're doing something bad, because it does record. You can actually go to Gmail if you're using Google, and on Gmail setting, you can actually check what is recorded on you by Google. I was seriously astonished when I checked that file. It was around a 10 GB file that Google collected on me. 10 GB is a very big space. And you know what was it? It was, I think, 10 years old data on me. And it had data, it had recordings, voice clips, like five second voice clips of the things that I, I didn't set Google to record it. For example, I'm playing with my son, and that recording is there. Google, have rec my phone is somewhere else, but it is recording. So that, that is why I, I don't. Yeah, yeah of course it is bad. But, but we give permission. And, and as I mentioned, as long as you're not doing something bad, then it should be okay. But, but the thing is, that is, that's why there are active lawsuits going on on Facebook and Google, multi-million dollar lawsuits, by the way, multi-million. Last week, one of the guys, I think, won more than $50 million from Snapchat. Snapchat is an app, social, social networking app. Why? Because of the privacy breach. So there are, there are a lot of um, active lawsuits on Facebook, on Google. Uh, you can actually watch that. They are so much interesting. They are so much interesting. When the CEO of Google and the CEO of Apple and all those guys come and sit in front of the cabinet and they ask those crazy questions that, why are you tracking us? Do you think that the Google, yeah, do you know your maps that we use maps? You use, use maps, right here? Yeah. Maps. The maps keep the whole record of where you have been to. The whole record of, so the next time you go somewhere that you don't want anybody to know, leave your phone behind. Because your phone, your phone is definitely, definitely tracking you in all forms. And then let's talk about positive side of it. When the phone tracks me, it tells me the things that I want through artificial intelligence, through machine learning. The phone learns my behavior. So for example, I go to the gym every day, suppose at 8 p.m. The, the phone starts learning my behavior every day I go to the gym at 8 p.m. But one day I don't go, the phone will give me a notification that it's the gym time. <laughs> then, okay, thanks for reminder, I don't want to go to the gym. But the thing is that it's a good thing, right? It's a handy thing. So the machine learning and collecting big data. Now, one of the things, I'm, 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 a, I'm a person in research who do quantitative research. I do collect data and do analysis. <laughs> And I know what do you mean by big data. Big data is huge repositories of data. Having the data is not sufficient. Try knowing how to use the data is also important. So you just know that 
there is a big data in front of you like a million entries in front of you but you don't know what to do with it that is useless so that's why machine learning is merged with big data and no computers are given the task to learn from the big data and show you the things that you possibly would end up by in terms of marketing I think I'm running out of time so I'll be a little fast <laughs> augmented reality what do you see augmented reality or AR marketing yeah AR marketing what do you see here this is a real app of IKEA Come, we have IKEA here IKEA Okay, IKEA is a home furnishing company. What, uh, what, what home furnishing company is here? Any, any home furnishing company. So it's a home furnishing company. I'll show you other example as well. A home furnishing company, IKEA, which is a common name I'm sure that you've heard of. Now, it's a huge uh, place. When you go in, whenever you come to IKEA or whenever you go to IKEA, wherever it is, you will see it's a huge establishment. There are big sofas and they have big beds and everything. And just imagine those of you who are household or those who buy these kind of things. You bought a very big sofa set. You dragged it to your home, to the sitting area. You put it there and it doesn't look good. And that's a lot of efforts wasted. And a lot of the time they will not accept the return. Suppose they accept the return, but that's a lot of dragging and putting it in your 20th floor apartment. That's horrible. Now, augmented reality have solved their problem. What do you do? You just simply install their app, open the app, and point it toward an empty place and select the product that you are interested in and it will look there. So behind this person that you see is actually an empty place and he have dragged dragged these sofas and tables to that empty place to see how will it look in his TV launch. If he likes it, click on it, put it in the cart, they will deliver. No, if you want to go, go personally and check how are the fabric and the material in, layer, in rail. That is what we call augmented reality. Now. There are many other examples. It is used in education a lot. You see a lady, for example, a student learning through augmented reality, a human system. It's a, it's a medical. It is used in Malaysia. It is used everywhere, by the way. Uh, I hope that it is used here as well, where you use your smart device. And in your smart device, you can actually see a book performing in front of you, a book performing in front of you. My, my, my son has a book, a, 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 kid, a kid's book, normal kid's book and it has it comes with an app it comes with an app i'm sure that is available here i'm sure about it so you find it it comes with an app you install the app you open the app give the permission of the camera and then the same book static book static can i have a book like this for example a static book yeah a static book like this yeah you point the camera towards it things start moving yeah. things start moving like it start talking to you the books start talking to you. That is what we call augmented reality. We have different, in Malaysia and, thank you so much, in Malaysia and other countries we have different type of um, uh, traffic apps. For example, we have Google Maps here. Uh, I, I don't know whether we have Waze, Waze here as well. So Waze in Malaysia has started doing something else. It's not only a, a, a social networking um, GPS, which is a, 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 a an app that is used to take you from one position to another. Now the marketers have ta started taking use of it where you can actually see a banner coming while you're driving. McDonald's is nearby, come here. Wow, that's, wow, that's good. <laughs> or a cartoon comes, or KFC is there, or Pizza Hut is there, or Starbucks is there. That is what we call the use of augmented reality in marketing. This is a very common game. I'm sure the youth have played it. It's called Pokemon. Yeah. Pokemon app. This, the, you don't, actually this thing that you see which is Pokemon, those of you who know what it is, Pikachu. Pikachu. Yeah. The Pikachu is not there in the in the real parking lot. The Pikachu is only an augmented reality in the phone. And some people got so much addicted to it. And of course there are accidents and so on and so forth. But a lot of people got addicted to it. One of my cousins, one of my co young cousins, one of my young cousins just like these young guys, undergrad, wherever I would go, oh stop, stop, stop. Why? Oh, there is a special character there and he would take. Augmented reality is used a lot even now in marketing where you see a signboard, take a put your camera in front of the signboard and the signboard will start playing in front of you. Well, that's crazy, right? Okay, I have a lot of crazy things and I'm running out of time. <laughs> Internet of brains. Now, let's get to the crazy part. <coughs> the first successful experiment was conducted by Wits University in 2017 where a live human brain was connected with Internet in real time. So the data was transferred two way from the brain to the internet and from the internet to the brain in real time. In real time, that's a picture of that by the way. In real time the data was transferred from, now that is good and that is horribly bad as well. I don't want internet to know about my brain. 
<laughs> there may be things going on that only I and my Lord would know. You understand what I'm saying, right? So it has a lot of implications. It has a lot of implications, positive and negative as well. But let's think about positive aspect. What about those people who are special people who cannot talk? The dumb people, the deaf people, for example, the, full, the fully paralyzed people, the people who are in coma. Let's talk positive. What happened to those people? You put this machine and what is going on in their brain, you find out. And they found out. I wish I had time, I would, sh I would share with you some of the things. For example, they tried to find out, scary thing, okay? They tried to find out what will a person go through when he's dying. Oh yeah, they found out. Uh, Google it by yourself. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'll tell you, don't worry, it's not scary. Uh, they, the, quick, the quick conclusion or the quick uh, summary of that is they found out that the person who is, a, who is on deathbed, who is just dying, um, what is going on in his brain is his whole life flashes in front of him. That's it. His whole life flashes in front of him in that second or a few seconds. Uh, the rest we don't know. We have to die to see that. Anyway. <laughs> And, and closer to that, and closer to that, um, closer to internet. So internet of brain, what is the implication in marketing? The implication in marketing is now they have access to our brain. Through internet, they would put somewhere in my brain, okay, go drink coffee from Starbucks. No, but I don't want coffee. But now the internet is pinching me, go drink coffee, go drink coffee, I'll go and drink coffee. They have direct access to my subconscious and conscious, and that is good and bad at the same time. So I told you two aspects. Interactive dreaming, a successful uh, experiment was conducted where scientists connected with the person who is dreaming. And he, the scientist, communicated with the dreaming person, and the person communicated back. And that's very interesting. So now, the scientist, that's a picture of that. That's what happened is, of course, these are only in trials. These are in the laboratories. But I told you that things we saw when we were kids, 20 years after, down the line, it came, became a, become a reality. Maybe 20 years down the line from now, or 30 years, or God, God knows how, uh, it will become a reality. So the internet would be there. Just put a small thing. Have you seen Google Glasses, the smart glasses? Yeah, it's, you know, it's somehow like that. So everything is connected there. You don't need to carry anything. And you will put, for example, a hat or a cap, and it will connect with your brain and then everything. So, so uh, to the students, my students were very excited when they, when they saw that. Say, okay, prof, you don't need to come to the classes because Google is there. I said, but then what if Google is down? <laughs> the, the, the Google servers are down and you are in your exam, that would create a big problem. So you need to use your brain. We cannot run away from that. So uh, a person uh, in the sleep was connected to and communicated back and forth. And the experiment was again conducted on smokers. That is a real experiment. Those of you are interested, I have references there in the last slide and I can provide you the links to those videos as well. These are videos, by the way. And the person, um, and, and the, the, the scientist found out that it could be of a lot of help. Because what happened is that the person was sleeping and when the moment the scientist connected with a sleeping person, a sleeping person uh, who who supposed to be um, a chain smoker, a chain smoker, you know a chain smoker who smokes a lot, who loves smoking. They, the scientist says that the smokers tempt to smoke when he or she sees someone smoking or smell smoke. Those of who are smoker, they will agree or disagree. I don't know. I'm not smoker. So when you see someone smoking, or if you smell smoke, you tend to you you feel like let's smoke. So they tried to do a research, and they said that let's find out a method to stop this person from smoking. Now, how did they do? Is that the person went to sleep? They connected with the person. When the connection was built, they made the person smell cigarette. So the brain part was activated that, okay, I need to smoke. Pay attention, okay? The person, this person was made to smell cigarette. So in the brain, smoking was activated that let's smoke. But soon after that smell, the scientist made him smo smell rotten eggs. So the brain did a crazy thing. The brain affiliated smoking smell with rotten eggs in the sleep. When the person woke up, he was offered cigarette. And he declined. He declined. Then the scientist asked him, why did you decline? Because I don't know, when I look at cigarettes, I, s I, I feel like rotten eggs. Wow, that's a lot of implications for that in the field of science and in the field of marketing and everywhere. The next time we wake up, we think of McDonald's only. 
Why? Because somehow they have connected with our dreams and we saw that in the dreams. Who knows? So these kind of crazy experiments were there. And let's talk about neuromarketing. I'll conclude. Uh, I had a lot of things. Anyway, so uh, neuromarketing. We can, uh, by the way, I'm, a, I'm a, a social media active person. And as I told you, I'm a Googleable person. So you can Google me. I have lectures online, video lectures on all these topics, which are freely available. So I have my own online school as well. It's called the Marketing School, which I'm going to show you in a while. I have links as well. It is freely available. You can go and enjoy these lectures uh, for free as well. Neuromarketing is the con combination of neuroscientists and marketers. Neuroscientists, the people who are um, concerned and who are expert in the brain work, and the marketers, when they sit together and they come up with the strategies, we call it neuromarketing. You know that we take decisions because our brain take, tell us to take decision. Our brain is the king of our body, right? You know that? Our brain is the king of our body. So when our brain tells us to buy something, we buy that thing. Neuromarketers find out a method how to tell my subconscious brain to buy something. And an experiment was conducted. I'll show you that experiment and then we can conclude. This ad was launched as a campaign of neuromarketing campaign to see the response of the respondents. Look at this ad and tell me, how do you like this ad? It's beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. This is an ad of diapers. Those of you who, are, who have kids, they have been through this time. So diapers. Now this ad significantly failed. It's a beautiful ad. It's a beautiful ad. I like a very cute kid smiling and those of you who love kids and who have kids they would really appreciate this 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 ad it's a beautiful ad but it failed significantly the neuromarketers were called to find out why the ad didn't work as it was expected by the way what is an ad ad is a company's campaign to attract people to buy your product so when this ad campaign was launched people didn't buy it so what happened is the neuromarketers found out the reason and what is the reason they did eye tracking marketing we call it eye tracking to find out that in this ad where are the respondents looking at most of the respondents were looking at the baby you can see the red spot is the most of the people's eyes looking at most of the people were looking at the baby face and it's a cute looking face of course so everybody was very few people were reading the text now if I'm a company I want people to read my text so that they can come and buy the thing what is the price? What is the product? So people were not reading those things. Rather, people are looking at the, the picture of the baby. Then they redesigned that ad. And what did they do? They did something like that. They made the baby look at the text. They made the baby look at the text. And then when they found out through eye tracking marketing, they found out majority of the respondents were also reading the material. Look, look at the red spot majority of the respondents started reading the material rather than looking and focusing on the baby a lot of companies that is an example of neuromarketing where where the companies find out which part of the screen are you looking at so that the pop-up come there you know through our cameras it's already by the way proven right that the cameras that we have on our laptop they can they can see us so you have to cover it if you are worried about someone seeing us and marketers see you by looking at your eyeball we call it eye tracking marketing or eyeball marketing what do they do they see where your eyeballs are moving on the part of the screen and through that they market to you the products only in that corner it started with the pointer pointer click click you know the, the click marketing and the key punch marketing these are all different names for it for example which part of the screen the mouse is moving if the you people tend to move the mouse in different parts of the screen by the way try to note it down next time when you use your computer so if your mouse moves more on this side marketers will try to market their products the pop-ups you know the pop-ups mostly on that part so that you click on it that is called neuro marketing when the people connect with your mind your subconscious mind I will recommend you to watch a movie it's a good movie. I, I love that guy as well. Uh, the name of the actor is Will Smith. Have you heard of Will Smith? Yeah. Will Smith is a very famous actor. Um, it's related to this topic somehow, how our brain works. Uh, the name of the movie is Focus. Focus. Some of you may have watched it. We tend to act the way our subconscious is designed. So in our subconscious through narrow marketing, we are bombarded with information every now and then and we start liking those things. So that is an example of narrow marketing. Now, what is the purpose? Should I say the purpose as well? Yes. 
Okay, just three more minutes. Okay. Two more minutes. Three. You're, uh, the three the, uh, with the three, you gave me an angry look. With the two, you are okay. One? <laughs> two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Okay, so what is the purpose? We, in marketing, the purpose, purposes could be many. Um, it is customer acquisition, acquiring customer. You want more customers to come to your company because you want business. Customer satisfaction, you want the customer to like you irrespective of your taste and quality. And you ask, the survey was, survey was conducted on Apple company, those people who have Apple, uh, and they, they were asked that, why do you buy Apple? And they said, we don't know, we like it. Why do you like it? We don't know. It's just, it's just a good product. So they, they have somehow tuned our brain to start liking them. And then customer retention, keeping the customer. These are independent, very detailed topics. Please refer to my online channels. I have online channels um, where you can find these topics. I've already explained them. Uh, customer loyalty is the key, where people want company, uh, companies want people to stay with them for a longer time. What else could be there? They may have any hidden agenda, we don't know. They may have any uh, negative uh, uh, plan for us, we also don't know. But optimistically speaking, so far everything sounds well, everything goes in our favor. We see the things, if I go to for example Amazon.com, millions of products are there. So search for the product that I want, it will take a long time for me to find. But through neuromarketing, artificial intelligence, I am, show, I am shown the product that I probably will buy. So for me, so far it is good. With that, I thank you so much. This is the name of the school, the marketing school, my personal, my personal free school where you can enroll and there are many courses, some courses are still developing. Uh, I also have an active profile on Udemy where the courses are not free. But if you don't have money, you can message me, I'll give you a coupon for free. And uh, thank you so much.